Welcome to section 5.1, History of Life. Now in this section, we're going to really look back at what we know and how we know about the organisms that have lived on this planet, about the planet itself and how long it's been around. And we're going to do that by literally digging through the Earth and analyzing what we find, which kind of gives us a piece of how things have worked throughout time. Now, what we're really talking about here is the fossil record. All right, so when we dig down, we're moving lower and lower, which is getting us to older and older stuff. And as we get to these older things, we can see how things change and we can start to analyze using other methods when things have happened throughout our history. And this history goes back in terms of Earth about 4 billion years. Uh, what I mean by that is this is how old we have rocks that are still around. So most people peg the Earth to be more like 4.5 or 4.6 billion years old in total, but we do have rocks that go back 4 billion years. We have fossils that go back about 3.5 billion years, but we believe that because those fossils were kind of pretty advanced bacteria, if you will, uh, that there's a good chance that it actually was more like 4 billion years ago that we got life. Now, fossils themselves are any remnant of life. Now that could be footprints, trash, it could be waste, like feces, it could be whole organisms like caught in amber, tree sap here, uh, mummified, they could be caught in tar pits, it can be parts of organisms like bones and shells, it can be mineralized imprints or imprints that have been filled in by mineral rock, so we now have like this rock replica of an organism that we found. All those things are remnants of life and can be used as fossils. Now, to be fossilized is a rare thing, but there are certain things that you can have occur that make it easier for you to get fossilized. And the most common way you're fossilized is you die, sediment builds up over you. Over time, as that sediment builds up, you start to have it transition from sediment to sedimentary rock. And then ultimately, because it does that, you then start to gradually decompose and you leave kind of this chamber, this mold as we call it, which oftentimes leaching chemicals like calcium can turn to rock and mineralize and fill in. So we now have a cast, you know, a mineral version of you that filled in this mold. Uh, and in some cases, you can just have actual bones or other pieces that persevere as well in the sediment or in the sedimentary rock. So if you want to be able to fossilize as best as possible, some of the useful things you can be is hard. You'll notice most of these guys that we find frequently that we kind of use as a benchmark are going to be shells. They're going to be rigid, hard. Uh, bones and teeth work too but exoskeleton could work, but shells tend to be some of the best things to fossilize. Being aquatic helps because it's easier to get covered by sediment in the water, so aquatic's a plus, and then being widespread because kind of like if you're trying to win the lotto, buying more tickets makes you more likely to win. Still not a good investment, but it does make it more likely. So if you have more organisms that are dying, more of a chance that one of them has this rare thing happen. You also can have if they're widespread in terms of territory where they take up lots of space. They're more likely to find themselves in a desert or near a tar pit or near a body of water, so they die and face plant in a swamp or something to where it makes it easier for them to be fossilized because they were in the right place at the right time to fossilize. So being widespread can help with that too. Now for dating fossils, we're gonna have two common ways we're gonna discuss first. This first one's where we look at things like uh, volcanic ash or volcanic rocks, and these contain radioactive isotopes. These are isotopes that will ultimately break down into another isotope called a daughter isotope that's different. And so we can analyze how much radioactive isotope we have and how much daughter isotope. And this will tell us how much of it remains from the initial amount. And because each radioactive isotope, they're different elements, decays at a different rate, we can look at the half-life and calculate the age of the actual rock. So let's say half-life is a million years. If I've got something that has one half of the original radioactive isotope, it's a million years old. That's one half-life, I have half left. Now if I do a second half-life, so we're now two million years old, you would have half of a half, or a quarter. If I wanted to see something three million years old, that would have half of a quarter, or an eighth. And you can keep going on. Now eventually you'll have where there's so little radioactive isotope left that we can't use it anymore. All we can find out is it's older than how far that, that isotope measures. So for instance, carbon-14 has a half-life of about 5,700 years. So you can go through enough half-lives to get to be about 60,000 years old before there's so little carbon-14 left, all we can say is this sample is older 
than 60,000 years. We then have to shift and pick a different radioactive isotope. And keep in mind, there are things like carbon-14 that's about, you know, five, 6,000 years for a half-life. And there's things like uranium that's 4 billion years for a half-life. So it's not like we have a shortage of things we can use to test things that are a million, a billion years old. We've got plenty of ways to do this with absolute dating. But it all comes down to looking at this rate of decay of radioactive substances. That's absolute dating. And you can see on the chart here, they've absolute dated some of these layers so that we can use them to help us figure out the other part, which is relative dating. This is going to be saying this thing is older than this other thing. This thing is younger than this other thing. And the way this works is the oldest stuff should be at the bottom. You know, if you keep putting papers in a drawer, the newest paper should be on top. The oldest paper should be on the bottom. So as we keep adding sediment, the oldest sedimentary letters, letters, layers are on the bottom, the newest ones are on the top. So if I'm looking at these seashells, I can see that they're below 495, so they're older than it, and they're above 510, so they're younger than it. So they're about 500 million years old. It might be 505, but they're somewhere in there. I can also say that these trilobite fossils down here are older than these clams because they're below it. I can try to get more accurate by looking at these other closer absolute dated sections to try and say it's between 520 and 545. But in general, I can date this relative to anything. I can date it relative to the clam. Uh, that's just going to give me a more general thing of you're just older than it. Not how old, but just older. Or if I have these absolute dated sections, I can get a much more accurate date. Now, beyond these, we do have things like molecular clocks. These are cool because many genes that change slowly have a fairly consistent mutation rate. It's not perfect, but they tend to mutate at about a certain pace. And so if we can calculate how many mutations have occurred between two organisms, it gives me a sense of how long ago those organisms diverged, how long ago they split and became two different species. And so we can use this for some of our fossils to verify the absolute and relative dates. We can also use this when we don't have fossils to try to figure out about how long ago something should have happened. And we can use that to go look at rocks from that age to try and find the fossils that we're missing. So molecular clock is a great piece that can be used with the other stuff, as well as it can be used in situations where we don't have the fossils and we're just trying to find where to look for the fossils or when to look for the fossils, if you will. So when you look at us and chimps, you can see we're very closely related, only 2% difference. Mice we're more dissimilar to, about 15%, because we're not as closely tied to them. We're, they're not primates. Uh, and then when you start to move to birds, you can see it gets even more dissimilar, about 40%, until eventually insects, you're over 50% different. But you can see there are still similarities. Now lastly, we've got the geologic time scale, which is how we try to package and organize the history of the Earth. So that way it makes more sense. So what we're going to do is just call the Precambrian all the stuff from kind of the start of Earth all the way through really when we started to get a diversity of animals. So this is about 4 billion years. It's huge. During most of this time, you're going to see you had single-celled organisms and some very simple multicellular organisms. With the Paleozoic, you start to really see the onset of plants and animals that are more similar to what we know. So you can start to see fish, you can start to see more complex stuff like amphibians. So this really is where, I guess, life starts to come into its own, at least as we know of it. And then with the Mesozoic, we start to see, once again, more evolved plants. We start to see reptiles. So the age of the reptiles, the age of the dinosaurs. We also see mammals and birds come onto the scene. And then eventually we have a mass extinction. You know, huh, what's that? Is that an oh, asteroid. Uh, and then we suddenly see all the dinosaurs die out, many of the reptiles die out, and so we get to the age of the mammals, which is the Cenozoic. So that's currently what we're living in now, 